Hello everyone, this is uh, Piero San Giorgio. Today I have the great pleasure to host Andrew Tate. Andrew, hello. Hello, hello. Good to see you, friend. Hey, look, uh, you probably need no introduction for the, any English audience, but as most of my viewers are French-speaking, uh, although they do, I hope, understand English, uh, you've been four times uh, world champion of kickboxing. You are a self-made millionaire and entrepreneur. Yeah. You've been a celebrity in the UK and you're extremely politically incorrect. And these are all things that I like. So that's why I wanted to, to, to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad we're doing it in English because my French is, is awful. I've, I've fought in France three or four times and I, I, uh, the French are hard fighters, man. The French are proud, especially when you, when you're English, they want to, they want to beat you. Sure. They, they certainly want to beat you, but yeah, my French is not so good, but everything else you said is completely correct. Good. I'm definitely not politically correct. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, a fighter, and I do a few other things. So, and indeed, you you have been uh, in the last few years, uh, I reckon, developing web coaching. And um, how how do you define what you do now? Because your your website is really cool. But uh, but how do you define that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I was on Twitter. I wasn't really big on Twitter at all until Donald Trump was going to be elected. And I was a big Trump fan. I believed that politics needed a shakeup. I needed. We, I believed we needed someone who was not simply a member of the elite. Most of these politicians have done nothing other but be politicians. They haven't done anything else. Their whole life has just been, oh, I'm a politician. Their whole way through Hillary, she was she was being groomed to be president since day one. And uh, I thought the establishment uh, needs a shakeup. So I was pro Trump. That's when I became big on Twitter. And I guess the reason I grew quite large before I was banned the first time, because I've been banned six times as of today. I'm banned again this morning. Ah, I woke up. Good. woke up and I was banned. So um, I, I think the reason I grew so fast is because I was very personal. I, a lot of people try and hide behind their, especially on Twitter, there's a lot of Anon accounts or they try and hide where they are and stuff. But I was very open about who I am, where I am, what I'm doing. And I think I grew quite a big following and people could see, you know, I was running around traveling across Europe in my Lambo and picking up chicks and doing all this crazy stuff. And I started getting asked lots and lots of questions. Like, how do you get girls? How do you make money? Or about my body language, about all these things. So I decided to put together courses uh, that teach people what I learned and what I know because I kept typing it out over and over again. And I thought, well, there's obviously a lot of people who want to pick my brains and see if I know something. And that's when I put the courses together that are on CobraTech.com. So we've got that now and uh, they do well. I've, 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 I can genuinely say I have never had a negative review, which surprises even me because I know they're fantastic courses, but there's always someone who's going to complain. But I've never had anyone email me and say anything bad. So, so where do you get, where you got the, let's say the, the content, the experience, the, uh, what you're teaching is, um, well, of course, I will actually. I must say to my audience, I will actually try one of the courses because I think they are they are they are pretty pretty unique. So I will try them. So I let I let people know how how it goes. But what's interesting to me is that you know anyone can say you know I'm going to teach life to everyone else, but um, but you seem to have a peculiar background and a peculiar approach. So what makes you um, what makes you confident that your what you're teaching, what you're saying in those courses is actually is actually good for people and actually works. For, for sure, I've lived, I've lived a life which has been highly polarized. So I've been completely broke. Like my family, my mother and father, when they broke up, we ended up in the social housing. Our whole family, my mother and, and my brother and my sister, so all four of us was in one room with, Kos with Kosovan refugees and refugees from Africa. This was in Luton, England. So I've been completely, completely broke. And I've also been rich. I've been... A nobody, I've been a somebody. I've, I've, I've been trying to get girls when I had no money and no one knew who I was. And when I was a millionaire and everyone knew I was a world champion. I've kind of lived on both sides. And when you live on both sides, you start to identify common themes. Certain themes are universal. So in my course, I say that women are emotional sponges. If you're in a bad mood, your woman's going to end up in a bad mood. If you're in a real shit mood and you come home and you really need support and for her to cheer you up, she might try a little bit, but over a couple hours, by the end, you're going to end up arguing because they, they, they absorb your energy. Mm -hmm. And this is why they like funny guys, because if you're humorous and you're funny, then they, they feel happy because you're happy and they pick up on it. So you start to notice, well, you, 
could do this when you're broke, you could do this when you're rich, but this stays the same. And you start to notice these patterns, and I think that's what it is. Uh, that That's certainly with the girls kind of thing, and, and a lot of it's just living a very varied life. I've been to 72 countries, I've done a lot of stuff, I've always been too brave for my own good. I've been Iraq and a whole bunch of places I shouldn't have been, and uh, you just learn a lot of things, and I, I kind of feel like I apply them. I'm quite logical with how I live my life. They work well for me. And everyone I've tried to give advice to, they've all come back and said, yeah, Tate, you know what you're talking about. So it's just, it's just been a matter of experience. And I like, I like to think that I've learned a lot of stuff the hard way and I can save some people some time. You know, mm -hmm. I had one guy who hit me up and he said, uh, you know, how, how do I know if this girl's trying to gold dig me or not? And I, I did a Skype with him and told him my stories of girls who were trying to get money from me and all these things. So I think it's good, you know, that, you know, why not share my mistakes? you got to make mistakes to learn, and I've, I've made a few. I've made plenty. I'm a human. So I just put them all in the course and said, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. And that's, that's basically it. Excellent. Now, you, you may, so actually, I will put the link to your, uh, to your website in the description of the video. And I must say that, uh, am I the only one who noticed that your uh, logo of the Cobra doesn't look like a Cobra? Doesn't it? You know what? I had, I, I've gone through, man, the story of this website's been a nightmare. I've gone through so many web design teams and stuff because I kept, I kept getting deplatformed and this and that. So it should be a cobra. Maybe it's something else. Well, uh, it looks like a cobra, but it also looks like a, like a pussy. <laughs> I don't know if you ever noticed, but it, it does. Must be a coincidence, friend. No, okay, I, I, okay. I would never advocate this. Never. Now, let's go back to another serious topic, which it is, in fact, is that you seem to be, one of the reasons you're politically incorrect is also because you're, indeed, as you mentioned, that you supported Trump, as I did, um, your views of the, of the world are not the ones that, um, let's say, the, um, the mainstream uh, media expect from, uh, from anyone who's, uh, who's in the news or is, is a celebrity at some point. Yeah. What's, what's your view of how the world is going today? My view is very simple, and my view is that I think humans have a very long history, and in that history, there's been certain themes which have reigned universal, and now we live in a modern world where they're trying to turn everything upside down, saying that that's going to be good for society. So I can give you lots of examples. So gender roles, men being in charge and a woman being semi-submissive and, and respecting her man. That's how society has always worked, and it's not just how it's always worked, it's how it's always worked everywhere. So this is not some idea that got shared because you had the Chinese, the Ming Dynasty, and the Aztecs on other sides of the world doing the exact same thing. So in my mind, I think it's natural human nature for men to have a certain role in society, to be a warrior and be certain things, and a woman to be certain things. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm not being horrible. I'm saying both are equally important. I'm saying that men have a certain duty to fill and women have a certain duty to fill. And the fact that every human civilization ever has done it the same way since the dawn of human time, means that, especially as from the fact that we've gone from a, a small tribe of a few thousand to populating the entire world, I'm saying maybe it's probably a good idea. But now we've come along in the last 10 years and said, that's a terrible idea. Men need to be like women and women need to be like men. And I just sit and go, why? Everything was fine. How can your few years of study and some psychological study garbage compared to all of human history. I say this because I got hit as a kid, not in an abusive way, but if I was too, I got warned, be quiet, you're going to get spanked. Didn't be quiet, got hit. And if you do that now, you say it to someone, they go, oh, that's terrible. And I say, why is that terrible? I'm very happy with who I am. I was very happy with how I was raised. I'm happy I lived in a world of discipline. I'm happy I knew boundaries. Since the dawn of human time, every time a kid made a mistake, he got a smack. We still built the pyramids. We still went to the moon. So tell me how you're going to come along now and say, if you touch a kid, he's never going to function correctly ever. When every child was raised the same way. Mm -hmm. it, to me, it's just crazy. So I think the world's gone, and I'm a relatively young man, I'm 32, but I think the world's just gone so far off the deep end in very recent history. In the last 10 years, you've seen the world go off the deep end, liberal, mm -hmm. left-wing insanity. And they're trying to think they can come along and correct human nature as if it's going to build some utopia. And that all the problems with the world are the inherent mistakes of man, toxic masculinity and the fact that men are patriarchal and all these, everything that got civilization ahead, everything that built cities, everything that saved lives, everything good that's ever happened, 
throw that out the window because what we need is we need men to put more wigs on and cry more often and girls to be in charge. And I just think, who came up with this shit? Sorry to swear, but that's my basic worldview, bro. It's just like, I don't know where these people have come from, and I don't know why anyone's listening to them. It's crazy. And at the same time, they import millions of people who actually are big time in the patriarchy. Yeah, oh, this is the thing that I don't understand. There's a massive cognitive dissonance. There's a massive disconnect with the logic of the left. The logic of the left is that all men are bad, especially patriarchal, oppressive men. And that women need to be empowered and men need to shut up. While also importing as many patriarchal men as possible. Like the, the, the huge intellect disconnect is hard for me to even get my head around. And in my mind, I really put this down to, to just a huge, in, in my course, when I talk about girls, I say that it's very often your woman will start an argument with you to see how you react. And I think this is like an evolutionary thing. They want to kind of poke you a bit yeah. and see if you have any fight in you. Because if you, haven't, if you haven't got enough fire in you to fight with her, then you haven't got enough fire in you to protect her. So they want to see how far, how much they can get away with. If they get away with too much, they won't respect you anymore. And I kind of feel like this is just society. These are just women in power as a whole trying to test all the men of society. When they come along and say, if you're a straight white man, you're bad. And everyone just doesn't say anything back. I think it's just like a huge test. You know, it's like they're waiting for us to say, shut up. But there's just not enough people who do it. You do it. Yeah, I do it. But course. there's too many people who don't do it. And they and it just gets and they what they do is they go, okay, we got away with that. Let's push the boundary some more. Let's let's see how far we can get. Till they get to the point where you have white men typing on Twitter, all white men are evil. And I'm just sitting there like, what's going on? The world's gone crazy, bro. Yeah, it's so um, crazy. I th- it's, uh, we are we are living again in a very racist society, which. Which is uh, which is very very strange, especially my generation. Uh, you know, I was born in the early seventies. There was there was no racism anymore, and now it's coming back, and I can see the difference because when I was a kid, you know, everyone could joke about everyone. I mean, you could joke about Jews, about blacks, about whites, about everyone this was. Is the, this is the thing. It, it doesn't it show how soft people have become when a joke is now like you can lose your job. Yeah. I mean, my my ethnicity is extremely hard to guess. No one guesses it because I'm part black. I'm part Native American and I'm part white. Yeah. And I'll tell you now, I've had more bigotry directed at me for being heterosexual <laughs> than, than anything to do with my color. Yeah. If I say I'm a straight man and I like to have sex with women, I get called misogynist, I get called dangerous, I get called a rapist, just, just for being a heterosexual male who enjoys female company. I get called bad names. If I said I'm a man who likes to have sex with men, that would be encouraged. Oh, good, good. Tell everyone, good. Whereas, you know, so people want to talk about bigotry, the most bigotry you're going to experience in the world today is if you're an alpha male who enjoys having more than one girlfriend, you're going to experience plenty of bigotry. And it's crazy to me because this is, this is natural human nature. The reason I am here is because a man and a woman had sex. The reason you are here is because this is how the whole world got populated. And now that is deemed as evil, but pointless hedonistic homosexual sex is deemed as progressive. That's an amazing thing. But it doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't create life. There's no love. There's no cre- There's no legacy involved. It's just it's hedonism, which is fine. But I don't see why hedonism is put above populating the planet or you know a, a loving family. Like well, it's really it's really messed up. And you know I can get conspiracy theorists and I can come up with my own kind of reasons why all this is happening. But there certainly is a link between falling testosterone levels in men between the fact that these nations are being absolutely not really overrun and them trying to feminize men at every every chance they get. I was saying this earlier to my mom. I was saying this literally an hour ago. I was talking to her. And I'll have to find the picture. In fact, let me find it on my phone right now if I can find it quickly and show you. And it was a parenting magazine. Here it is. Uh, For the I, last six months. I lost your, I lost your image, by the way. Say again? I lost your I lost your image. I can hear you fine, but I lost your image. You can't see me? No. Let let me just do something. Okay. So look, look at this. This is the last six months of a parenting magazine. The last six episodes of a parenting magazine. I don't know if you can see it clearly on camera. But there's six yes. episodes there. We have two men, a gay couple with kids, 
We have a woman on her own. We have two women. We have a woman on her own, a woman on her own, and a woman on her own. For six months in a row, on a parenting magazine, there is not a single normal family. <laughs> but it's like men and women have kids. You've got two guys, two girls, and a bunch of girls. Like, where's, why can't you just have a normal family now? And I think they've gone so far with acceptance that they've gone into promotion of all these abstract lifestyles. You but never see a normal lifestyle promoted anymore. They probably notice also that their sales are dropping because people don't buy the magazine anymore because no one can can project into an image that doesn't fit. You know, it's like it's like uh, I'm going to take a, a, a tangent here, but it's like you know, whenever at least in Western Europe, and we'll talk about the difference between East and Western Europe. But if if you go in the West, in France, in the UK or the US, whenever there is an advertising showing a family, hundred or ninety percent of the time it's a black man with a with a white woman. Yep. And this is not is not corresponding to reality, and and then they yep. complain. They say, well, oh, well, people people are not buying my brand, or like Gillette, we know they 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 try to to show women as as a men as 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 weak and uh, and and, yep. and really strange behaving, and then they will complain that people are not are not are boycotting the brand. Well, of course, you 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 giving the finger to your to your customers. This Absolutely, but they, they seem to think that this signaling of some kind of virtue is more important. I say this all the time. I, I say to my mom, I say, why in every single TV show, every single TV show, I'm not homophobic. I have no problem with gay people. Sure. And I, if you want to be gay, be gay. So yeah, it doesn't bother them. me. It, I don't care. But I don't see why there must be gay sex in every TV show. Why do they think, okay, we're making a TV show. We must have a gay person. Like 3% of the population is gay or something, yeah. whatever it is. It's not a hundred. It's not. You're not going to find like on TV every single group of free people. There's some raging homosexual. I don't understand why. And it's just some kind of weird promotion. They're, they're trying so hard to prove they're accepting that they've gone on to promoting. Why not promote a man falling in love with a woman and having some children? Why not promote the most basic biological thing? That and this is what the world needs. I saw a T-shirt the other day. I, I think this is why I might have got banned. I saw a T-shirt the other day. It said the future is gay. <laughs> and I wrote, there is no future exactly. if it's all gay. There is no future. The future is heterosexual sex that creates children and, and, and families that raise them to be productive members of a society. That's the only future. There's no future which is coming all over the floor. I mean, sorry to be, you no, know, I know I'm a bit crude, but it's just like, it's crazy. I don't know what these people are talking about. It's interesting because there, there was a novel, uh, a science fiction novel of the 70s by uh, author Joe Haldeman, American author. And he imagined in the in the in the future, maybe a century from now, that 100% of the people in the world would be gay. They would be selected to be gay, and that children would be made based on those selections as well. They would be made in 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 in, in vats, in vacuum, in in some in some something. And and therefore, and they said, well, when when everyone is gay, first of all, we can control population, and then um, you know, no one is uh, no one is fighting anymore because well. Which is a mistake because he probably never met any lesbian couple, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, he said no, no one was fighting in that book, and 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 therefore they could control population, having having everyone homosexual. Um, it it seems very dystopian, but um, but well, yeah. something's going on. I mean, even now in the West, all of the population levels are declining, so we're we're losing people now. Yeah, we've gone so far with, and this is what happens when when countries become developed. And I, I can complain about this, but I'm 32. I'm, I'm having kids probably this year, but 32 is late to have your first kid. In, in okay. terms of bio, in biology, I could have had kids at 21. You know, so I, I'm guilty of this as well. But you're in the you're in the modern world, the Western world. You get a career, you want money, you want a fast car, you got this, you got a lot more choices. So do the women, and it slows down the reproductive rate. And and that's a, a you know that's just a side effect of economic prosperity, which is fine. But you also have to do something to combat that. I mean. Because that's what a lot of this immigration is down to. It's down to declining population levels. And they think, oh, okay, we'll just let in some immigrants. Well, the problem is the immigrants still, they still have six or seven kids. So you're going to get outbred. It's not even about, you can look at it from a purely mathematical standpoint. You haven't even got to look about politics or ideology. All that's by the by. Pure math is, going to, is dictating that in 100 years, you're not going to find any white people anywhere. I'm a brown guy, so I can. I mean, I'm a brown guy myself. I'm not saying that you know brown is better than white. I'm just saying there's not going to be any white people left because there's not having enough kids, you know. And this is the reality of the world we live in now. You go to Nigeria; they've all got nine, ten kids each. 
You know, it's, it's crazy. And the liberals come along and they seem to think we need to let them all in because their own country is terrible. But that's, that's, that's the worst idea ever. I was speaking to a liberal the other day and they're saying, well, if you were them, wouldn't you want to leave? And wouldn't you want to come here? And I was saying, yeah, of course I of course. would. But the point is this. Firstly, only the most energetic members of a society are going to manage to make that trip. So the people who are coming here, they're not their best and brightest, but they're certainly their most energetic and ambitious. And you know what? You know as well as I. You don't have to be the smartest person in the world. If you're ambitious and you're energetic, you'll usually find a way to do something. You know, So you've got people who are ambitious and energetic and, and good physical health who could go and carry bricks or build a school or do something, just bailing on the country, leaving. Yep. And then on top of that, no matter how many we let in, the populations over there are still increasing because they're having kids faster than we can accept them. So you're not fixing any world problems. You're keeping the countries poor by taking away all their physical human energy, and you're letting in a small fraction, which is destroying our society, while their populations still increase faster than you can save the others. It's just, it's just bad for everybody. It's universally bad. It's just like it doesn't make any sense, but these people are driven by compassion, and they're not driven by logic, and, and they don't use their minds, and they don't use their brains until it's too late, and then something terrible happens, and they're like, oh, should have thought that through. You should have, but it's the world we live in. Now, you live in, uh, you live in Eastern Europe, I think in Romania, yeah. and uh, you've seen uh, countries I know well, I've been living and working in Eastern Europe most of my life, you've, you've seen the difference between the, the let's say, East, East and the West yeah. uh, of Europe. What are the main differences and what made you choose to live in Eastern Europe rather than, uh, than, uh, than, let's say, stay in the UK? There are huge differences. And I think to many people, unless you've actually spent extensive time in both, you may not notice, but there are huge differences. And, and the differences are, are ideological. And I have my own theories as to why they are, but there's a few things. Life is harder in Eastern Europe in general. And a harder life, it breeds a more logical person. You know, it's easy to be an emotionally driven person. When you're born, you live in your parents' house, they buy you a car, you go to school, you study art. Like, you know what I mean? Of course, you you haven't got any real trouble, really. You think you have trouble, because everyone, every, like, stress is relative. Everyone has stress. But my point is, you're not living the hard, we need money today to eat today life. And in Eastern Europe, there's people who still do that. And when you live that kind of life, you're more logically driven. You're more sensible. Secondly... Eastern Europe is still more religious than Western Europe. And I'm an atheist, personally. But I respect the fact that the best countries in the world were built on Christian traditions. I believe the best countries in the world were built on Christian traditions. So I have respect for Christianity, at least up to that point. I respect the tradition of Christianity. I like the idea of seeing churches around me. I respect all of it because it produces societies I like. So even as an atheist, I understand how important it is to have a national identity. Because when you have a religion, you have a national identity you can rally behind. When you have an agnostic or an atheist country, then you're like, ah, oh, let, let them build their mosques. We don't care. We're not religious. And before you know it, the national religion is another religion because you don't have your own. You know, so then you end up like the Western Europeans. So they're more religious. On top of that, I think maybe it's a hangover from communism, which is still in recent history. But family units are stronger over there. I've been on dates with 25-year-old Romanian girls, and they say, ah, I've got to be home at 10, my, my dad said so. At 25, you go to England, you find a 17-year-old girl, she's drunk out of her mind <laughs> after sniffing cocaine at four in the morning with her shoes off, falling asleep in the street. Yeah. Because, because the families aren't together. And in, in, in the West, we think we can police certain things. Like we think, oh, before you go in the nightclub, show your ID, you know, scan everyone's ID at the door so we have them all on record. But you can't police... Things like societal values and family values. You can't police this. In Romania, you go out in Romania, you'll see a 17-year-old girl go to the club, have one drink, two drinks max, and walk home with grace. You go to England, you see 22, 23-year-old girl, drunk out of her mind, throwing up in the toilet. Yeah. And, and, and it's only in England she had to give her ID. In Romania, no one cared how old she was. Don't even ask. Because over there, you still have family values. Families still stick together. And this is the thing. What is a country? A country is a society. What's a society? It's all about groups, and it all starts with a family. A family is at the very basis of a society. And then you have a larger group and a larger group, and it goes up. You destroy family, you destroy the fabric of everything. And I think in Eastern Europe, their families are still together better. You know, and Maybe it's a hangover from communism. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but they're less divorced. 
and people respect their parents more. They don't want to upset their parents. You know, like even in England, we have these TV shows in England now where these teenagers go away to these islands, like, they, you know, on TV, reality show, and they go away to these islands, and they're all fucking each other on TV and stuff. And I was watching it with one of my Romanian girls, and she said, never in a million years would a Romanian girl 17 have sex on TV. Never, she would never be able to walk down the street again. Whereas in England, these girls are famous. They come back, they're on Instagram with two million followers, they're in the newspaper. Like, just, we've degraded so far as a society under the name of progressive, progressivism, progressivism, and it's just like, where is it getting us? You know, like, what are we gaining? I don't, I don't, I don't see the gain. I think we can still, I don't see any gain in destroying families. I don't see why that's going to benefit us in any, in any way. So there's a huge difference between the West and the East. And on top of that, another thing, and I think it's a combination of factors for this. Maybe it's a combination of the fact the Soviets turned up and gave them a hard time. Maybe it's the fact that they were fighting the Ottoman Empire for such a long time. But they're more hostile to foreigners. And you know what? I respect that. I'll tell you a story, man. My brother and I were in Moldova, next to Romania. A country and, full of little snowflakes, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> we were in Moldova, and, and, and a few Romanian guys said, don't go to Moldova. It's, it's a lot more like Russia. It's a lot, few years behind us. And we went anyway. So me and my brother, we went, and we, had, we found some girls. And the truth is this. Moldovan men know there is zero reason for American men to be there besides women, because they're beautiful. True. So, and the average wage in Moldova is like 250 bucks a month. So me and Tristan are walking down the street with these three girls, and this guy starts screaming to the girls in Russian, why are you with American men? Why are you with American men? And an argument started. And before you know it, this guy and four of his friends start coming over, and then some more guys got out of the car. And me and my brother were surrounded by these 20 guys. Luckily, we diffused it. We were just like, look, look, cause we can fight. We're fighters, but 20 against two, you're going to fucking lose. Sure. So we're like, sorry, sorry, we just apologized and left. But, and to many, that's a bad story. But in other ways, I kind of sit and think, This is their country. Sure. And they're Moldovan men, and they see American men walking around with three of their beauty queens. You know, and we, we get paid shitload more than them, and they're hostile to foreigners. And in a way, that's negative, yeah, but in another way, that's the reason they don't have any of the problems we have. Because if you tried to go run their citizens over with a truck, and then go preach the same ideology the next day in a nice building, how long do you think your building would last? <laughs> it's like never in a million years would they accept that. Yeah. So I kind of respect them for being that way. They're more hostile because they've lived a harder life. And that's fine with me. You know, I understand it's their place and I respect their place. And I'm a visitor. And I believe that I, don't, I have nothing against immigration. I have nothing against people visiting the West. But they should show it respect. Mm. You know, and, and nobody does. They just shit on it. And I think that's our fault for being weak. And I like to go to countries where they don't let you do that. If I tried to burn a Romanian flag, I don't even want to know what would happen to me. Well, you know, and I like living under that kind of society. You should show respect to the places you are. That's what I believe, anyway. No, that's interesting. Now, where do you see the West going? Because, let's face it, uh, for every one person like you or me or, um, you know, Paul Joseph Watson or, or, or others, there's, um, there's a hundred that are cucks and that, yep. that just bow down and that do nothing. So, uh, where do you see this going? Bro, I, I don't like to be a pessimist, but I, I, I mean, I speak to these guys, I speak to Paul Joseph Watson and stuff, and there's a lot of guys who still, you know, they believe they can turn the tide, and I, I kind of, I don't want to be a pessimist, but I kind of think the fight's over in many ways, because something drastic would have to happen right now. We don't have another 50 years. We don't have another no, 100 years. for sure. It would have to happen right now, and the national sentiment isn't there. You have people like Tommy Robinson trying to point the truth out. And the people he's trying to save are telling him he's a racist and they should lock him up. Like, it's insane. These people are not ready to be unplugged from the Matrix. So I kind of feel like in many ways, in the West especially, it's over. And it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. I don't know what the future is. I know that in, if I was alive in 200 years from now, I'd probably be in Singapore or Hong Kong or, you know, Ukraine or somewhere where they just resist absolutely this globalist mentality. That's probably where I'm gonna, I'd end up. And, and to a degree, yeah, I mean, I didn't run away to Romania. I, I left England for my own reasons. But I, 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 I'm not even mad at, at, the, at the people who are conquering the West because my view of the world is very much that the weak has all, have, always conquered, have always been conquered by the strong. The strong have always won. Like, I'm part Native American. So when I'm in America, we talk about how the, the white man stole the Native American's land. And I sit and say, 
No, the white man won the fight. Yeah. And this is the reality of the world. Every country border, you don't have to put race into it, even in Africa, black on black. Oh, every yeah. single country border has been decided by conflict. And the winner got the border they wanted. So you can't deny that conflict is right to something because it's how the whole world's always worked. Mm -hmm. So if the Native Americans didn't stop infighting and didn't band together yeah. and kill the few settlers when they first turned up or when they started to fight back, that was their problem. They were too busy fighting each other and the white man just did, they got their shit together and was smarter and they won the fight. If you win the fight, you win. So when I look at the West and I look at how weak our institutions are, how weak our justice system is, how weak our mentality is, and I sit and I see us being conquered, I can't be mad at the conqueror. It's like, well, this is the nature of Earth. You know, like we're just, we've just become weak as a society. You or me, we're one man. A one man can only do so much. But as a society, we no longer have any any strength left. You know, we don't even lock people up if they, if they do these crazy things. In, Eng in England, you walk around with a knife and you're an immigrant. You go to court and say, I didn't know it was wrong. Cultural differences, sorry. And you don't, you don't go to jail. Yeah. Like it's it's crazy. And then you want to blame them? You gotta blame us. I, I I really look at it this way. If you look at Dubai, for example, I, I was in Dubai recently. Dubai has massive immigration. Yeah. Because the Emiratis don't do any work. Yeah. So it's all they it's all Indians and Pakistanis and people from other countries who do all the work there. But they have zero problems with people disrespecting them and zero problems with crime because they are so stringent. You make half a mistake, you lose your visa. You make a full mistake, you go to jail for basically forever. You respect our land or you leave. Why haven't we done the same thing? We can still have immigration. I'm not saying no immigration. I'm not saying no immigrants. I'm not being racist. I'm saying force them to respect the place they live. But we haven't done it and we refuse to do it. And trying to do it makes you a bad guy. Me and you are bad people for trying to get some respect for our ancestors, for the great men who died in Europe to protect our land. We're bad men now. So, this is, you know, what can we do? If people are that desperate to be conquered, they're going to end up conquered. And this is, that's the reality of the world. It's funny because I, I, did a, I did a video on exactly the same topic last time I was in Abu Dhabi, just near next to Dubai. And word, word for word, I think I said exactly the same thing. So it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite funny. Well, because it's, it's the reality, right? Now, uh, absolutely. In, you may, you, as, you may, as you may know, I'm, I'm, I write best-selling books about survival. Yeah. But not the typical survival in the woods and, and how you shit on the floor and, the, and, and, and bury that under the, under the grass. It's really how you, as, how, how you put s survival strategies for you, mm -hmm. your family, your communities... Yeah. Uh, whether you should, um, you know, move away from the cities in the countryside and build estates and or, yeah. or, or, or change countries, things like that. Now, what are your thoughts? Because I've seen that you're against uh, gun control in, 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 in general, and, yeah. uh, and, and that is a, a linked topic. What do you think about, about survival? And, and indeed, if things go bad, what do you think people should do to prepare? And, and how actually does this link to what you're also teaching people to do? For behavior? Yeah. Absolutely. So the gun control issue, if I actually like the idea of living in, living in a society without guns, but I also understand that that's very, in America especially, I mean, the people who preach for gun control in America are, are stupid because the gun saturation is so prevalent that if you outlaw guns, that means that people who obey the law won't have guns and criminals who by nature of being criminals don't give a fuck about the law, will still have guns. Yeah. So all you're doing is stripping away the rights of a, of a, a law-abiding citizen to protect themselves. Because everyone's going to... Criminals will have such easy access to guns because they're everywhere. Banning guns does not make them vanish. And people always go, oh yeah, but in England they ban guns. In England they never had a fraction of a percent of the gun saturation they have in America. So it's a stupid comparison. It's, so it's dumb. So yeah, America, you need guns. I like the idea of living in a society where there are no guns, but that's even getting impossible now. In countries, they're banned. There's still shootings nonstop. Of course. You know, so the criminals, if you're a criminal, you don't obey laws. So making a law against something, it's like, <laughs> it doesn't work. Like, you know, it's, it's crazy. But yeah, as for survival, man, you've got to be anti-fragile, yeah. especially in the world we live in nowadays. Because even me personally, I've had four bank accounts closed. I've had my PayPal closed. I've had six Twitters banned. I've had YouTube. I've, they banned me everywhere. 
everywhere because I, I don't know what I said one day, but I ended up on some list. And now they just want to ban me everywhere, which is fine. But it's kind of like I've had to take steps to prepare myself for that. And, and for a long time, I was kind of sitting there thinking, how do I learn to live off the grid? And like, hi. And I realized that in the modern world, that's nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. So what I've done instead is I put myself on as many grids as I can. So I did the opposite. I thought, you know what? If they're going to take my English passport, I'll have a Romanian and an American and an Estonian passport. If they're going to freeze my Estonian bank, I'll have an English bank. So I've got bank accounts everywhere. I've got seven driver's licenses. I've got four passports. So now I put myself on so many grids that it's hard to stop me doing anything. So like I had my driver's license taken two months ago. I just gave him some random one. No, you take my Estonian license. I'll just drive on my Romanian. I don't, you know, so now I'm, I, I kind of anti-fragilized myself by getting on more grids. It's the only thing I could think of and it's worked pretty well. But yeah, you've got to be prepared to survive. And the reality is, especially as a man in the modern world, you, you, a lot of it is down to just your mindset. And I know a lot of people teach this and say this, but I have loads of guys come to me and they're like, oh, this is hard. That's hard. And I don't know where everyone got this idea that life was supposed to be easy anyway. I don't, know, I don't know where everyone got this idea that life was supposed to even be fun. Who said that? Did you ever get a handbook at the beginning that said life has to be fun? You must be happy? Certainly Maybe not. we're all here to suffer a little bit. Exactly. You know? I would say certainly the Buddhists don't think that. Exactly. Exactly right. So maybe we're all here to suffer a little bit, and that's what it's all for. And, and I, I say this to people. I say you need to view yourself as a hero because then the suffering makes sense. You know, if you watch any superhero movie... They're suffering. Yeah. Every superhero suffers. So if you see yourself as a hero, then the suffering has meaning. If you give yourself meaning to suffer, then the suffering isn't so bad. That's the reason I fought. I had a re I broke bones. I, I, you know, I cried. I was nervous. I was scared. But I suffered for a reason. I have world titles. So I say to these people, you can either suffer and be a somebody or suffer the pain of being a nobody. You're going to suffer. So, so which one do you want? You know, but... We live in a society where they're, because they're, they're trying to feminize men and destroy their warrior instinct, you're left with all these men with just just empty vessels, just sad, because, I'll give you another example, I say to one of the, well, I've got a guy who I coach one-on-one, -on -one, and I said, the Romans melted rocks, made swords, and walked in random directions, without Google Maps, just walked around till they found a village and fucked it up. Because there's something instinctive inside of men you need to conquer. Now, I'm not saying we need to do that. But you need something to conquer. You need an objective. You need a task. You need a mission. And if a man without a mission is a sad man. It doesn't matter if you're climbing Everest. It doesn't matter if you're collecting stamps. It doesn't matter what the fuck you're doing. But you have to have a mission. And there's people out here without missions. And this is all down to just the feminization of man and telling men that the more manly they are, the worse they are as people. And if a man buys into this, he ends up miserable. Mm. Because he's miserable because, one, he becomes unattractive to females. That's the first thing that happens when you become a little pussy. You don't get a girlfriend, which sucks. And secondly, you, you just end up eating up all this propaganda. And what's actually scary is this. Another thing I was arguing with the liberal about just before I got banned is, they were, I said this to them, and they say, well, yeah, that's true, but the world will be a safer place if men aren't. You know, because toxic masculinity is dangerous. And I, I had to completely disagree with them. I said, you're completely wrong. Every time there's danger, you need a big, strong, brave man. You do not need a man who is uh, versed on gender inequality. You do not need a man who marches at feminist rallies. You need a man who's ready to do the right thing, even though he's scared, to do the right thing with honor. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, this is what really pissed her off, but it's the truth. Men are taught from a young age to control our emotions. And women aren't. Of course. Women are more emo women are more emotionally incontinent than a man is. They'll show their emotions quicker and easier than a man is. And they think by teaching men to be more like women, they're going to have a whole bunch of men who just cry all the time and are really soft. What you're going to have are men who are violent. You're going to have men who lash out. You're going to have school shootings. Yes. You can have rapists. You can have men who can't control the other side of their biological urges. This is what's more dangerous than anything. You show me a man who can't control his emotions, that's a dangerous man. So this is the thing. They think they're promoting something of they think they're promoting something valuable. All they're doing is removing a man's sense of duty and honor. 
and telling him, well, if you feel like going and raping that chick, just give in to your emotions. It's insane. It's why society's breaking down. Plus, if I may say, I'm, I'll, I'll add something here, right, which is, uh, which is uh, if, if you have to fight an enemy, or, or even if you have to do business and, and you're in a team, if, if one guy is emotional and, and ends up crying on the side, he's a liability to, to whatever you're trying to do. And, Absolutely. Uh, and if you put yourself into a conquering, if you're a conquering you know, war band or, 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 or tribe and you, you, you go into place and you have two different kind of guys. One guy who says, I'm going to die till my, till, I'm going to fight till my last breath to yep. protect my, my, my tribe. And I may lose, I may die, but I will fight till the end. Yeah. And the other, and, or you have another guy who says, oh, please don't kill me. And he goes on the side and cries. Which one you might spare? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Which one I, you will keep? And you, we, at least if, if you say, well, you probably you would say to the guy who's fighting hard and say, look, you, found, you fought valiantly. We won. You lost. But here's the deal. You can join our tribe because yeah. we're going to keep someone like you, but not yeah. the guy who is crying. This is the thing. You know, I'll tell you a, a, a God's honest true story. I swear to God this is true. It must have been about four years ago. And I got in an argument with some... I don't fight on the street. I don't like it. I'm a professional fighter. I don't like to fight on the street. I got in an argument with some guys. And the guy... And there was three guys. And it was me and this other guy who I didn't know very well. And they started threatening me. And the person I was with started, like, shitting himself, getting afraid. And in front of these guys who wanted to attack me, I said, if you're going to be a pussy, just leave. I'll, do, I'll, just, I'll fight them by myself. Fuck off. Because I, I'm better by myself than with a coward. Yeah. I don't need a coward beside me. Like he's, he's worth nothing. He's, he's a liability to me. And the fact that I told my friend to fuck off in front of the three other guys made them think, well, okay, this guy's... <laughs> and it actually diffused the whole situation. Yeah, but I think, exactly. But I meant what I said. I'd rather be alone than with a coward. I'll tell you another story. This is another God's honest true story. This was one week ago. I was asleep in bed. And uh, it was about 12.30 at night. This is in London. And I was staying in a house. I was with my girlfriend. And my brother was in the other room. And the doorbell started ringing. 12.30 at night. Ding dong. Ding dong. She wakes up like, well, who the fuck's that? I was like, I don't know who the fuck that is. 12.30 at night. So I go and I knock on the door. I said, I had my underwear on. I walked off the door. I said, Tristan, Tristan, someone's outside. He gets up. We put our jeans on. We go downstairs. Straight to the point, man. I'm a combative individual. I don't fucking know these people. I went straight to the kitchen. We got two knives. We look out the. We go to the front door. We look out the window. It's a fucking moron delivery man who was ringing the wrong door. Mm -hmm. But when we went back to go to bed, the girl said to me, "She goes, I, I love you." And I was like, "Why?" She goes, "You didn't act scared. You didn't say call the police. You just went and got a knife and said who thing." Because that's the reality of the world. What the fuck else am I going to do? Yeah, Someone, exactly. you know, they might be trying to break in. Might be five of them. I'm gonna get a fucking weapon and I'm gonna make it. If it was if it was guys, I would. Me and Tristan would have been like, "Yeah, you're gonna fuck. Have to, you're gonna fight in here. You're gonna die in here." And try and intimidate them away. But that's the reality of the world. But most men nowadays will sit in bed and shit themselves. This is the reality. You know? And and I have a sense of honor. Even if I was sure to die, I'd do the same thing. What else am I going to fucking do? This is how I've been raised as a man. But we've destroyed that in men now. No. Sit in bed and cry with your girlfriend. Discuss gender equality. And send her downstairs. It's crazy. And you wonder why we're being destroyed by people who come in from another nation. You know, it's just, we're just being overrun with basics. We've lost our gender roles. We've lost our valor. Man, I'll tell you now, watching World War II documentaries is enough to bring tears to my eyes. I watch what these people went through. You know, you watch these people went through. I watched one the other day about these guys in, in, desert, in the desert who walked eight days to try and get to French-controlled Chad from Libya after their tank was blown up. Eight days. The guy tried to bite his own wrists with his teeth to drink his blood. He was so dehydrated. And he survived. And I look now and I see people crying over tweets. And I'm just like, I don't know, man. It's, it, it upsets me. It's like people have lost their scope of reality in many forms. You know, it's crazy. Now, when, when, you, when you mention, indeed, your experiences in fight, and uh, whether professional or in the street, but also... You know, you, you, you explain a lot on your on your videos and on your um, on your on your programs how you approach women and, and for men all of these activities they have one thing in common is that at the start what prevents you to do all of that is fear and yep. you need to conquer your fear and yep. um, I'm actually writing a book on this 
And I'll be very interesting to have your, your point of view and, and your opinion and ex- on your experience, on how you conquer your fear and, um, and, and how you tame that, how, how, you, how you manage that. I think fear is just anticipation. Fear, you're, you're only going to be scared if you think something bad will happen. That's what fear is. Fear is anticipating a bad result in the future. I wasn't scared for my first fight. I was 0% scared, hmm. and I won. And I wasn't scared for my second or third. I only started getting scared after I lost the fight. Mm-hmm. Then I was scared. I was like, oh shit, I can lose? Like, although you are, obviously you know losing's an option, but until you experience it, you know, you don't experience it. So fear in many ways is just anticipation. So what you have to learn to do is, especially in many situations, is understand that what you're anticipating is one, unlikely, or two, not important. So... If you're going to go into a gladiator pit, you're scared. Of course, the outcome can be very, very bad. If you're going to approach a girl, if you do it respectfully and kindly, the worst that can happen is she says, go away. That's the worst. But people, they build themselves up and they anticipate it. This is where the fear comes from. What if this? What if this? Nothing bad is going to happen. But they just have this anticipation about it. Me and Tristan have this rule. And I think I've heard other people say this before, but if you if we see a girl, well, now we've trained ourselves. It takes time. We've trained ourselves. If I see a girl I want to approach, I do so within two seconds. If I see a girl, bang. Because if you sit and you think about it, you end up being, oh, who's that person? Maybe her boyfriend's over there. Oh, she's talking now. She's on her phone now. Maybe. And then you just fuck it. It never happens. So it's like I've learned now that if I go up to a girl and say, excuse me, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. I'm sorry. You're absolutely beautiful. If I say that, it's very difficult for her to say anything negative to me. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. But I'm with my boyfriend. Okay, no problem. I just want to tell you that. Nice to meet you. Done. It was a positive interaction. She got a compliment. She said thanks. Everything's fine. People anticipate these weird scenarios. So what's happened is guys have gone up to girls and they've had a bad experience and it's just shaken their confidence forever. But what's crazy is this. The girl you went up to, she forgot all about the experience. She doesn't even remember it. So you're upset by something. She doesn't even, it doesn't even cross her mind ever again. So it's a non-event. Like, what are you upset about? Who cares? I've made, I've looked stupid before. Everyone has. But the girl, the girls, it happens to them so often, it doesn't even stick in their mind. So you just got to be like, yeah, you're beautiful. I'm going to go tell you you're beautiful. And that's what all fear is. It's anticipation of something that's really not important. You know, you got to learn to just get rid of the ego a little bit and be like, yeah, whatever. You're never going to have a 100% success rate. It doesn't matter who you are. You know, so you just got to be, be yourself and just go tell her she's beautiful. And as long as you're respectful, what's the worst that can really happen? And that's all it's about. And you're in your different business ventures. How do you, because obviously the combat, the, the fighting is, is uh, as you described, but how do you, how would you put that into the business? When you start a business, how does, a, how do you know, we know, you know, I've, I've had businesses myself. Yeah. You know how, how we can be scared. Well, I don't know if scared is the word, but sometimes we, we anticipate, as you said, yeah. the, um, you know, the cash flow projections problems, yeah. the, I don't know, the permits, the, the law, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So how, how do you tame that? So what I try and do is, whenever I try and start anything now, is I try and start it as if I was broke. And the reason is this. I tried lots of businesses when I had no money. And when they failed, because most of them did, I only lost time. Mm-hmm. And time's important, but you lost a bit of time. But what happens is when you start to make money, then you start launching things and you start losing money. You can't lose money if you don't have money. Mm-hmm. You know. So yeah. when I was successful with my first business, I started with no money. Now if someone comes to me and goes, I want to start a business, I say, okay, how can we do it for zero euros? Zero. Oh, but we can't. There must be a way. Find a way. Or as little as possible. Mm. And, and, and the way I do, and I do that because I believe many good ideas will find a way to float themselves. If I start a coffee shop, and it's going to be a successful coffee shop, and I start it on bare minimum money, after a month, I should have made enough money to pay for the thing, to pay for the rent. Sure. If I start a coffee shop, but I need to put in 100000 to keep it open, then, then, what, then what am I doing? So my view of business now is very much like I get a lot of people who come to me and they say, oh, Tate, we need this much money for this, this much money for this. I'm like, look, if it's a good idea, we don't need any money. If it's really a good idea. Or fair enough, you might have to rent a premises or something. But you know where I'm coming from. I think a lot of people, especially 
I think business is not dangerous when you're broke because you have nothing to lose. Business is dangerous when you're in the middle and you can lose all the progress you've made. Yeah. And this is where the mistakes come in. So, I mean, I'm not super wealthy or anything, but now I'm at a point where I try and say, yeah, I'll start anything, but I'm super reluctant to put my money into something. I'll try hard, you know, or I'll do just enough of what it takes. I've done crazy things, bro. I've started new limited companies to get leases, knowing that if I don't make money in the first month, I'm just going to skank on the lease and let the whole company go under. And I think like that. I think, you know what? I'll get this premise as a three-year lease. I'll pay one month. And if it doesn't work out, they can go sue this company, which I'm just going to close. Sure. And I, I think that way because, you know, what's the alternative? Oh, we didn't make money this month. I'll put more money in. Maybe next month, more money. In. I'm very logical. I'm very, I, I, I played chess for a long time. My dad was a chess grandmaster. I played chess as a kid. So I like to look at the world with a very logical point of view. What's the best move to make? Yeah. If after a month we have not made a penny, then you know what? Maybe I should try somewhere else. So that's, I think that's the biggest thing people need to do. You need to dedicate your time and stuff, but a lot of people seem to think you need all this money to start a business. And especially on the internet, you need very little on the internet. Yeah. If you're going to do an online business, you really don't need much. You know, you need, you may have to learn some things yourself, you know, or you might have to find a student who hasn't got much money who will do it cheap, but there's always a way. So I get hit up every day. Oh, Tate, I want to do this. And if I had 50 grand, I could do this. I'm like, bro, if you had 50 grand, you wouldn't need to do that. It's just it's chill. For those who listen to us, this was excellent advice because I've been, I've been, and I still am business owner uh, of a few businesses. And uh, I, I, you know, when you're young, don't spend money starting your business. Just do it. Make uh, this advice is excellent. When you're my age, 47, you may say that then time is more precious than money. So then yeah. you shouldn't lose as much time as as before. But it's a different yeah. different story. But certainly, when you when you want to start businesses young, and probably your attitude is better if it keeps even even when you'll be old like me, but because uh, because if you, if you if you don't have that discipline to yep. to not you know to not take that financial risk, um, you you will end up with the financial risk, and you will end up pouring and having and having these money losing businesses that yep. so many people end up into. Sure. And you do, and you have you have to be ice cold about it, man. Like yeah. a lot of people, it's easy to get emotionally attached to your business. Yes. I put so much work in, I put so much time in, but for me, I am very much like I don't care if I sell sand, I don't care if I sell bricks, I don't care what it is. My emotion is about how much money's at the end. That's my emotion. So if something's not working, it's not working. That that, that you have to be that way sometimes. You got to be strong with yourself. I know it's hard to come up with ideas and such, and you may think, well, this is the only idea I have. But if it's not a winning idea, it's not a winning idea, you know? But, yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of people on Twitter, especially, who say, like, don't have a job and all this shit. I don't agree with that. There's nothing wrong with having a job. But I think, especially now in the age of the Internet, I think anybody can start a YouTube channel for pennies, start mm -hmm. saying something of value, start offering a little product at the end. You can always find a way, you know, to build an audience court some attention and do well. These are things that cost nothing, you know? So I think there's always a way if you have that enterprising spirit. I've tried a thousand things that didn't work. I'm lucky I didn't put, I didn't lose any money in any of them. You know, I just I just tried things and didn't work. I, if I needed, I, I did it on the bare minimum because I didn't have any money. So I didn't have any money to lose. So I was completely broke. So I've, I've tried lots and lots of things that didn't work. But And I think back now, happy I didn't have money. Because if I had money, I would have lost. I would have lost the same, but I would have lost a bunch of money thinking about I put money in, it'll work. And most times it doesn't. You know, great ideas don't often really that need money that often. You know, especially with online stuff. So, yeah, that's what I say about business. There's nothing wrong with having a job. There's nothing wrong with starting something on the side. The internet's a fantastic resource. You can do a lot of stuff online. But yeah, just try and do it as cheap as you possibly can. And you've got to be ruthless in this game. You know as well as I, you've got to be ruthless sometimes, man. It's, it's not easy. It's certainly not easy to make money nowadays. But sometimes you've got to be ruthless. Sometimes you hire staff and everything's going well, but there's just no money there. And you just got to be like, sorry. <laughs> how it is. how it is. It's how it is sometimes. Andrew Tate, thank you very much. Where can people learn more about you? So I had a Twitter, but got banned this morning. Ah. So the best, the best place to go is my YouTube. I Hopefully that will be around for a while. It's not that big, but it's youtube.com slash Tate Speech, which mm -hmm. is a play on hate speech because I was actually – I got an email about that from the British authorities for having an opinion. Not allowed to have an opinion over here. Of course. Um, 
so Tate Speech on YouTube, and my website is CobraTate.com. Um, on the CobraTate.com, like you said, we have the courses, and I, I actually teach a very unusual business, I know, but it's, it made me a lot of money, which is the webcam business. I made quite a lot of money with webcamming and how all that goes. I mean, I could talk about that forever, but in fact, I will give a, a final point on it. It's, I find it quite interesting that all the problems we've highlighted in this podcast have actually contributed to how I've made my money. Like beta males are the males who, who spend money online for female attention. Yeah. And I had a business where women would sit and talk to men online. So it's actually quite interesting to me how it all ended up benefiting me financially in the end in a, weird, in a strange way. I'm not saying I'm glad the world's this way, but I positioned myself there, you know. I mean, with webcamming, it's not all betas. You have a lot of guys who just, you know, want to sit there and chill and talk. And then if you have loads of young men, 19, 20, never had a girlfriend in their lives, you know, just sitting there sending away their inheritance money. And it's just, it's really crazy. And that's how I made my first amount, my first large amounts of money. And I teach that business as well on my, on my website. So if you can make money that way, you can make money anyway. I guess that shows, shows that you're in the right place at the right time. It can be done. So Excellent. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll talk again. Absolutely.